How about our first guest speaker today, Dave Gilbert? He's a lifelong resident of Dansville, having graduated from Dansville Central School. He is the vice president researcher for the Dansville Area Historical Society and has written several books on the history of Dansville. He's going to give us a little history of Clara Barton. Here's Dave Gilbert. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this very special event. Clara Barton has a lot of things named after her. The list includes at least 25 schools and 13 streets, like the one in Dansville. There's also a library in New Jersey, a hospital in Kansas, a homeless shelter in Massachusetts, a sequoia tree in California, and a crater on the planet Venus. <laughs> She's included in at least half a dozen various and sundry halls of fame, like the one in Dansville. And along with the one we're dedicating today, there's a statue of Clara Barton down in Hagerstown, Maryland, close to where the Battle of Antietam took place, and even one in Santiago, Cuba, where she did relief work during the Spanish-American War. Outside of religious figures, there aren't very many people who have received as much unqualified acclaim as Clara Barton has over the years. Not that she was perfect. In fact, one of her imperfections was what landed her in Dansville in 1876, where she would spend most of the next 10 years of her life. But that wasn't the first time she'd set foot in Dansville. That was back in 1866, when she came to town to give a talk on her relief work on the front lines during the Civil War, which was, ver which was what first brought her into the national spotlight. The visit did not go off smoothly. She had to walk the last mile into town when the stage from Wayland broke down. And it was December, and it was dark. Also, attendance was low, so her local sponsor had to reach into his own pockets to cover expenses. On the plus side, Barton would make the acquaintance of two people who would play a significant role in her life in years to come, Drs. James Caleb Jackson and Harriet Austin from the Dansville Health Retreat known at the time as Our Home on the Hillside. Over a period of two years, Clara Barton would crisscross the country, delivering around 200 of these talks, a grueling schedule that eventually took its toll until she collapsed mid-speech at a lecture in Portland, Maine, and she spent a year recovering at her home in Washington, D.C. This was Clara Barton's perennial problem. She was not very good at pacing herself and much of her life was spent in a repeating cycle of working herself to exhaustion, followed by a lengthy period of recuperation. In 1868, she took a trip to Europe, supposedly to rest and relax, but instead she got caught up in an organization formed in Switzerland a few years back, the International Red Cross. The more she saw, the more she liked, and the more determined she became that America should have an organization just like it. When war broke out in Europe in 1870, Clara Barton was more than willing to help out, help out with the humanitarian assistance to civilians affected by the strife. But once again, she wound up pushing herself way too hard, and by the time she returned to America, she was in worse physical condition than she was when she left. And as weeks became months and months became years with no sign of improvement, it was looking hopeless for her. But then in 1876, she was reminded of a health facility in upstate New York with a considerable reputation for helping the sickly in a valley nestled community she'd actually visited once before. With nothing left to lose, she wrote a letter to Dr. Jackson he wrote back offering some suggestions, the most important of which was, come here and let us help you in person. This she agreed to do, 
and later she would call it one of the best decisions she'd ever made in her life. Thus it was that in May 1876, Clara Barton found herself back in Dansville as a guest at our home on the hillside, and for a while at least, the shoe was on the other foot. Instead of her taking care of others, others were taking care of her. She partook of a healthy diet, which of course included water from the celebrated All Healing Spring. Emphasis was placed on fresh fruits and vegetables, as well as various whole grain products, including Dr. Jackson's pioneer breakfast cereal, Granula. They also encouraged exercise if one was up to it, and women were urged to forsake the customary floor-length dresses and tight corsets in favor of Harriet Austin's American costume, which were essentially women's trousers. Clara did try it for a while, but not very long, as I expect our stature will, re will reflect. But perhaps the biggest lesson she took away from her stay at our home on the hillside was how to relax, that there was nothing wrong with a little me time, freeing her mind from the troubles of the world. For the first time since childhood, she found herself getting a good night's sleep on a regular basis. After about a year in Dansville, Clara Barton felt healthy enough to get back to work. She resumed her campaign to get the federal government interested in supporting a national Red Cross, which meant traveling back and forth between Dansville and the nation's capital, hoping to win converts to her cause. It was a long, tough slog, and there were still a lot of political bigwigs who would refuse to listen to any proposal if it was a woman doing the proposing. But there were also a growing number of Civil War veterans holding office in Washington, and as far as they were concerned, Clara Barton could do no wrong. In the end, her perseverance paid off, and in May 1881, she and a group of Washington politicians, journalists, and philanthropists got together to sign the formal charter to what was initially called the American Association of the Red Cross. The next step was to begin forming local Red Cross branches, excuse me. <coughs> and the most obvious place to start was Dansville. On August 27, 1881, close to 100 people met in what was then known as the English Evangelical Lutheran Church to form the Dansville Society of the Red Cross. Chapters two and three would be organized in Rochester and Syracuse. Just two weeks later, they received their first call to action to raise money and supplies for survivors of a devastating forest fire in Michigan. Given the group's modest membership, it wasn't a huge amount, but it was enough to put America on notice. The Red Cross had arrived, and it was ready to help. Over the next five years, as the organization grew, Clara Barton found it necessary to spend more and more time away from Dansville, and in those five years, a lot of changes took place. Her two closest friends in Dansville, James Caleb Jackson and Harriet Austin, retired from the health resort and moved to Massachusetts. And in 1882, our home on the hillside was leveled by a fire. It would be replaced by the huge brick structure that would one day be called the Castle on the Hill. But for her, it just wasn't the same. So in March 1886, Clara Barton made the hard decision to leave Dansville for the last time. Your pretty town has given me back my strength, she said in her farewell address. And that was no exaggeration. Before she came to Dansville, no one was expecting her to live much longer. But she did live on for another 36 years before passing away in 1912 at the age of 90. Nine years later, in 1921, the Dansville Red Cross chapter was rechristened Clara Barton Chapter Number One, adding to the already growing list of things named after her. And now to go along with the street and the chapter house and the hall of fame and the soon to be mural, we dedicate a statue to the most famous person ever to live in Dansville, New York. 
But while we do, let's also tip our hats to those men and women of the village for the 10 years of support they gave to Clara Barton and the work they put in to help assure that her dream of an American Red Cross would become reality. We have as much reason to be proud of them as we do of her. Thank you.